Excellent. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our second webinar in our telework series. I hope everyone is enjoying their Friday and is staying safe. My name is Chris Mahoney, and I'm an outreach specialist for the Florida Department of Transportation District 5's Commuter Assistance Program, Rethink Your Commute. If you were unable to attend last week's webinar, you can find the recording on the presenting sponsors website. I'm joined today by Drew Kalazuski and Bernie O'Donnell from Partner Consulting, who will be diving into collaborative technologies for telework. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items. Your microphones will be muted for the duration of this webinar. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to engage and ask questions at any time throughout this presentation. A recording of this session as well will be available on the three presenting sponsors' websites next week. We should especially like to thank Phil Winters and Christine Epps at Cutter, the Center for Urban Re Transportation Research, for allowing us to host this webinar series on their Adobe platform. This telework series is brought to you by District 1's Commuter Assistance Program, Commute Connector, District 5, Rethink Your Commute, and District 7, Commute Tampa Bay. Yes, ma'am. All right. <laughs> Your local commuter assistance program offers free employer consulting uh, services to help identify, establish, implement, and maintain a viable commuter program for employees. This series is also in it's also brought to you by Best Workplace for Commuters. BWC is a program that provides qualified employers with national recognition and a unique designation for offering outstanding commuter benefits. If you feel your organization meets these requirements, or if you'd like to learn more about the program, please visit bestworkplaces.org for more information. I'd like to take this time now to highlight my awesome team and give them a shout out. Starting on the left, we have Ms. Karina Rodriguez, our program coordinator. We have Ms. Lenita Dobson, who is not only an outreach specialist, but also uh, we refer to as our transit training guru. Next up is our program manager, Mr. Stephen Alianello. Next is a man with many titles, including certified cycling instructor, outreach specialist, and our office comedian, Mr. Reginald Nels. And lastly, the newest member of our team, Ms. Priya Lauchen. Our team serves nine counties in the central Florida space by providing smart transportation solutions to the central Florida workforce. I'd like to introduce our speakers today, starting with Mr. Brody O'Donnell. I'll let him take it from here. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, Drew Kalazuski is here with me today and they will be joining us on the, the Q&A portion of our, our discussion and uh, we hope we can, we can have an interactive session. We'll go through the slides but certainly do jot down those questions and uh, we'll have time for Q&A at the end and uh, can get to the specific concerns that you might have. So with that, let's go to the slides. Uh, the the telework technology changes that we've uh, we've all more or less been thrown into lately. Um, like many other changes, we, we find some things that work better for us, and we probably find some things that are a little difficult to adjust to. And uh, the initial shock, especially in our our current scenario, of having to uh, rather involuntarily uh, abruptly change our work style from an on-premise uh, work style to a telework work style uh, brings a certain degree of change that uh, we probably don't like. And uh, as we get adjusted to some of these things, we find that there are some pros and cons either way. Um, we, we're used to a certain way of working, and when you make that change, uh, being human, we're a little resistant to some of that change. But then finally you, you find some silver linings and find that there are pros and cons to each way of working. On premise, you typically had employer provided standardized uh, tools, applications, hardware, and most of your meetings were in person. Uh, people were very accessible. Everyone worked the same core hours generally. And your business locations were 
were fixed. Everyone was uh, where you expected them to be and generally available. As we move to a telework environment, um, we're using tools, we're using applications that are uh, typically in the cloud uh, in terms of our uh, access to them. And that's, that's a case certainly where, where that's a benefit and uh, you can access your information anywhere from multiple devices, um, multiple forms of communication. You're probably using video much more these days than you may have in your, your typical work environment. Uh, and finding the, the pros and cons of each of these different ways of working. And uh, it, fortunately, we have an abundance of connectivity these days, whether our home internet, um, you know, Wi-Fi that might be out and about at, at public places, and uh, our cellular services these days support uh, pretty high bandwidth and can, can work well for most anything we want to do, be it video, file transfer, or just connection to the applications and, and people that we're working with. Uh, to me, the, the biggest difference was all, all the in-person meetings at work. Half, half of the meetings that I went to, I only showed up because I knew somebody was going to bring food. And uh, that doesn't usually happen in the, in the telework environment. In terms of collaboration at the office, these physical meetings allowed a lot of drop-in, a lot of spur-of-the-moment uh, contact. Everyone was available. People were generally there. Um, but when you tried to set up some of these physical meetings, some people didn't get to participate. Some people weren't present. Uh, some people had other commitments and other meetings. And the choices were typically made that, that you either went on with the meeting and people were excluded, or you delay and reschedule the meeting. And uh, sometimes that can affect a project and affect uh, customers and clients. And um, now, with some of the tools we're using in, in a telework environment, uh, that doesn't have to be the case. Meetings can be recorded. Uh, meetings can be shifted to, to different hours fairly easily. You don't have to wait for someone to drive across town to join your meeting. So there are some silver linings here in the, in the telework environment in terms of including everyone. Uh, the tools are changing. The tools in the office or at, at our work environment were typically um, shared by a large number of people. Uh, sometimes you wouldn't have a projector or, or something available to you uh, because it was shared by multiple people. And in the telework environment, the tools that we get through the collaboration tools that we use on our devices um, provide much of that function. So in terms of replacing the in-person collaboration that we had in our work environments, um, you know, voice and video is taking place of a lot of the in-person meetings. And um, video video was used, I think, by, by most people I know fairly lightly um, in, a, in a work environment where everyone shows up to the same building or facility. And now it's certainly used in a, on a, a much higher level and uh, by a lot more people. And there are tools, uh, fortunately, to, to make that easy for us. Um, some of the collaboration tools like whiteboarding and instant messaging and screen sharing um, really help you to get right down to business and actually can result in much shorter meetings uh, because of the, the, the great facility that these tools bring to your, to your work. Um, you can shift your time. Um, you, can, you can engage on the screen directly with something that's on someone else's computer and, and share editing. And it's a, it's a great tool. And it's even though it may have been available to us in our typical workplace, we may not have been forced to use it. Uh, so we tended not to use it. Some of the collaborative technologies that are out there uh, come as, as part of some of the suites of tools, collaboration tools, and uh, uh, applications like Word or Excel and, and PowerPoint presentation tools. And uh, these collaboration tools integrate very nicely with a lot of these applications that let you uh, directly share some of the documents and uh, co-edit a lot of these documents. The um, uh, video conferencing tools in particular, I think, are difficult to 
necessarily find that everyone you want to collaborate with happens to be using the same tool. Um, you'll find you may need to be on a WebEx, you may be using Zoom, you may be using uh, Google Hangouts, and we all need to become a little bit adept at, at a few of these products. And uh, fortunately, they, they have fairly common um, uh, features to them. Uh, you know, a button or a, a, a mute button might be in a different point on one versus another, but they're fairly common in use. And uh, you don't necessarily have to feel that you, you should just select one. You'll probably find yourself using more than one. Slack brings a little different perspective where uh, work you're doing or projects are organized in more of a channel structure, a little different than the typical email structure for communication, and uh, keeps things organized in terms of keeping people on focus for uh, particular products. And Zoom has certainly taken off as a, uh, a popular uh, tool for collaboration, uh, very easy to use, and uh, a lot of people have, have picked up on that on a for personal use as well as telework use lately. And uh, these are all software as a service tool tools. Some of them offer free or, or freemium type uh, entry into using them where you, you try them out and then uh, decide if you want to pay for a higher tier of service. Uh, it makes it very easy to scale up or scale down quickly uh, where you don't have to physically access each person's device and uh, uh, load software on them. So this is these are great tools in the in the sense of scaling up quickly in the environment that we're currently in to to get everybody in the the telework mode. So in terms of trying long term to look at the technologies you're going to use, you do want you know depending on the size of your organization and the people you're working with, go through a technology assessment process in which you define your requirements and your requirements, you'll probably initially tend to define them on what you were doing yesterday. And you want to look at those hard because what you were doing perhaps doesn't have to be what you continue doing. So this is also a great opportunity to think about how you work and what your requirements should be. The, um, the current technologies that are out there will probably um, you know, fulfill your needs, but there'll be issues of cost and convenience and uh, the people you work with as, as to what you might select. It's a great opportunity to try things, to, to try some of the free services especially, and test them with some of your peers. Um, form a group, form a little committee, and, and have some test meetings and test calls to go through the features and see which ones you like best and what the pros and cons are, and then your group can typically agree on the products that you will continue to use. And you will determine gaps. You may find that there are some features that don't come with the free products, and it's worth paying for a higher tier of service. Um, th there will be things that are missing that you may test for a while and find, can I live without them? Is it is it really a big deal that these features are missing? And uh, over time, you'll be able to determine whether there are additional items you want to pay for uh, or whether you just change the way that you decide to work. So as you look at these requirements, your, your hardware requirements, um, the hardware side is, is fairly easy these days because most of these, um, to most of these applications and the software as a service um, applications work on most any platform. Uh, it's pretty low impact in terms of, of beginning to use these uh, these applications on any type of hardware, be it a tablet, a laptop, a phone, a computer, and uh, whether it's a Mac, whether it's a PC, iOS, Android, most of the application developers, um, you know, are targeting the the a large uh, breadth of products and services to to work with. Um, probably the biggest issue with some of your hardware might be if you have something that's old and won't run um, certain applications. Maybe some of the custom business applications you might have for, uh, you know, an engineering or a, a CAD engineering type application that, that might require 
um, a high degree of processing from a, a computer. Um, if you have a, a computer that's more than three years old, it, it could be some issues with it. But by and large, the hardware you have um, will probably run most of the applications you want to you want to look at. Um, the the collaboration tools um, again for for common platforms. Um, if if I'm on a, a, a Zoom call, uh, I might be on a laptop, someone else might be on a computer, someone else might be on a tablet, and yet someone else on a phone. So it, uh, the, the requirements uh, uh, can fit people who are mobile, who are on the road, who may not be carrying a computer with them and may only have a phone or a tablet. When you get into file sharing, um, you, you certainly need to consider policies as basic file sharing, but then there may be security issues, um, custody of data, um, backups, uh, who's backing up the data, who has custody and, and is controlling that, and retention of files. Some of these things happened in a very automated sense in your, your work environment, but if you're using your own computer at home and making some of those decisions manually, that may have happened in an automated fashion uh, in your, your typical work environment. There may need to be some discussions and, and policies made around some of these things. Um, your environment, there are definitely are requirements there. Uh, some of your work, you may want it to be very quiet. You want some level of comfort. Uh, internet access is key, so uh, you, you may pick a quiet location to work and find that your Wi-Fi doesn't reach there so well. Um, privacy, you know, power, of course, uh, are all considerations for your work environment during telework. In reviewing the current technology, um, most of the applications people are going to use, be it with a, a, a Microsoft 365 or, or Google or, or Apple or any of the other typical word processing spreadsheet presentation tools can work together. Um, you may lose some formatting or some differences in, in moving files around, but most of them can save files in formats that others can use. And you'll, you'll find that there really aren't the difficulties that if, if you had tried to move into a telework environment a decade ago, um, it would have been much more difficult. Some of the HR or, or business applications that you may need to access remotely may have some additional access requirements um, in terms of you know dual factor authentication that your employer might require uh, in terms of protecting data and, and protecting access. Um, the hardware again, um, fortunately, most of the hardware that we have at home is compatible with the hardware that we were using in the office. There are exceptions, uh, but most of us can move to a telework environment without requiring that our employer ship us the hardware from the office or, or something like it. Um, as much as possible, if you can leverage your existing technology, be it your personal devices or, or work devices that you already have, um, you don't need to become familiar with them because you've already used them. So that it's faster to implement telework with them. Uh, it saves money versus buying new technology. And it minimizes the learning curves because, again, you, you are already familiar with them. So in determining gaps, you want to identify what those requirements are that aren't met by the current technology. And uh, in trying new things, you may find there, there are things that you didn't know were requirements, but once you try some of the new tools in teleworking, um, you may find they, they are things that you want to use on an ongoing basis. So once you experiment with the features and determine which ones are useful, um, again, whether you do it on a, in a small organization with just a few people or with a large, in a larger organization, you may want to form some kind of a committee and develop some kind of standards so that um, you know you aren't having to use um, five different products to accomplish the same thing. And uh, of course, how it meets your budget is important. And uh, through using those free trials, um, you don't have to, to bust the budget just to try things out. So 
you get those requirements and, and see where the, the current technologies uh, meet them, and then, then you've got your gaps. And in, in those gaps, you may find that although you're using free services or things that you've already got, the, the gaps may dictate that you, you do bite the bullet and say, you know, you, sometimes you just get what you pay for, and it is worth moving up to a, a higher tier service from one of the products that you're using and uh, paying the money per user to, to get the features that fill those gaps. So in terms of, of protecting your online resources, we can talk a moment about uh, private information. You know, some people are dealing with uh, employee information or client data, customer data, and uh, th there could be business strategy or financial information that um, as you move that information around, uh, you need to make sure it stays secure. And bad actors or, or folks who are, who are out to uh, uh, try to capitalize on, on the current vulnerabilities um, will typically try to either exploit the weaknesses in a system or they'll try to exploit the weaknesses in a human. And if, if you're not reasonable about protecting passwords, access to information, um, how you transmit information around uh, between people. There, there are folks out there who will take advantage of that. Uh, ransomware has, has been very much on the rise. A lot of uh, state and local uh, agencies have been victims of ransomware. And for, in most cases with ransomware, those who have fallen victim to it are those who have not maintained backups of their information. In the, in the case of ransomware, um, your, your computer is tied up and you can't get access to your information. Well, if you have that information backed up on a separate storage device or with another person or another location, uh, Worst case, you can walk away from that computer and all you've lost is, is the value of that information on the computer. And if, if your information is only there on that one device and that's worth a lot of uh, money financially in terms of time or the value of the information, um, there are people who've made that judgment call and paid the ransom. And uh, we hate to see that because that certainly promotes the the, the market for ransomware. So do your backups and you'll, you'll avoid falling victim to that or being in a, in a bad place. And you also need to look at, uh, you know, the fraudulent charity websites and uh, all the fraud activities that go on in terms of uh, emails or notices, um, especially trying to get you to click on a link uh, or, or look at something that, uh, may look like it's too good to be true and people just can't can't resist on on clicking on those things so uh, look for those suspicious looking emails uh, even emails that could appear to be from someone you know uh, but that their computer and contact list has has been compromised and uh, uh, caused someone to be able to send emails that look like they're from your supervisor or your peers and in reality they're not so do be cautious in, in this environment. Uh, Zoom bombing is, is an example of that. And it, it appears that uh, if you've heard in, in the, the mainstream media about the, uh, the term Zoom bombing, where folks have broken into uh, Zoom meetings, usually by using valid credentials that were posted in public places uh, or intercepting emails, or from an insider perspective, where they've gotten an email from someone or a link from someone who is part of the meeting and has shared it with them. And uh, they've chosen to come into meetings and disrupt them, and sometimes just for the purpose of disruption. And uh, it, it causes the organizers of the meeting to have to uh, cancel the meeting uh, and, and try to reschedule with everyone. So uh, there are protections against that. Products like Zoom in particular, you, you can download and start using Zoom having known nothing about it in probably 60 seconds. And because of that, people do that and they don't necessarily go through and understand and test all the features. 
So what you want to do is go in and understand how you can control a meeting, not only with Zoom, but with other products that could fall victim to the same uh, disruption. Um, watch where you put the passwords and the meeting links uh, to make sure that you don't fall victim to that. If you, you keep people in a, a waiting room, you can admit them you know, at, at your choice and have control over the meeting. Some of the products allow the moderators of the meeting, especially the webinar versions, uh, which aren't the free versions of the software, uh, to really control the meeting to a great degree uh, so that you're not a victim of that kind of uh, disruption. So in terms of your home office setup, uh, your, your computer microphone and speaker um, spur of the moment might get the job done, but if you're going to be using your computer on, on audio conference calls and video calls, you need to invest in a headset, uh, preferably with a good noise-canceling microphone. Um, it will really keep you focused and, and help the people even more on the other end of the line than it helps you, but you'll find that it ensures clear communication uh, and it, it keeps keeps from being a, a, a disruptive uh, aspect of a, a discussion, whereas your computer microphone will pick up all the background noise in the room and uh, uh, a headset will, will really uh, be worth its weight in gold in terms of uh, um, using that. And you'll find they're not, you can certainly, like anything, spend a lot on them, but you don't need to spend a lot to get a quality headphone. Um, for video calls, watch your lighting. Um, you know, preview your video, uh, look at what your background is. Um, the, the cameras on the computers and a lot of the webcams have a very wide angle of view. And if there's anything disruptive in the background, uh, the person on the other end is going to focus on that rather than you. I was watching a, a newscast where even our national newscasters are broadcasting from home these days. and. Uh, this particular one, there was a, a white spot, a pretty large white area on the wall behind and to the right of the newscaster. And obviously it was coming from the sun coming in the window, but also there apparently was a tree creating a shadow. So you could see this movement in the shadow on the wall behind the newscaster. And it was very distracting. It, it took a minute to figure out what it was. But that's exactly the kind of thing that can distract the people that you're trying to conduct business with. So make sure there's nothing confidential and nothing distracting in your background. Um, hold test meetings. Test each of the tools on your conference calls, be it be them audio or video. Um, by doing that and by starting your meetings early, you can make sure the meetings will run smoothly. If, if folks are there at, at five minutes and nine, you'll be able to start conducting business at a nine o'clock meeting rather than starting at, a, at nine and conducting business starting at five or ten after. So it's, it's worth getting everyone to join early. Just the process of multiple people joining a meeting is disruptive because everyone needs to say hello, good morning, and it takes a few minutes. In terms of problems with your home internet, um, as much as possible when you do have a problem, if you can eliminate components, if you, for instance, are using your Wi-Fi, well, if you can eliminate the Wi-Fi and check just where your service comes into your your home, um, you can determine, is it the Wi-Fi, is it the modem, is it the service itself? And most of the Internet service providers today have pretty good automated systems that when you call for service, They'll step you through actually unplugging devices, testing certain things, giving them the results, and taking you to the next step. So rather than having to wait on hold for a half an hour for tech support to help you, um, they'll, they'll get you working through their automated system to try to uh, resolve problems. And, and those can be quite helpful. Another recommendation I'd have would be to form, if you don't have technical support from your employer uh, and you're not highly technical yourself, to form a little affinity group or, or technical group um, just to commiserate and, and talk to each other. If you have, be it, be it four people or 40 people um, to whom you can 
send out an, a message and uh, let them know you're having a problem. Someone's probably had that problem before, and they can save you a lot of time in trying to resolve that. The, the, uh, uh, the problems that you're going to have, um, especially if you're having them with a computer and a, a cable modem, um, sometimes will force you just to move over to a different service. You can use your cellular service, use your phone, um, and use the bandwidth on your, your cellular device. Uh, the mobile hotspot is typically a slower internet speed than you might have um, with your home cable modem or other internet service, but it will work, and it will work, you know, fairly well. Um, so try try as much as possible to uh, share information with your coworkers and see if they have solutions. Um, another solution is, you know, as clearly as possible, just, just a Google search because, again, um, there's, there's probably no problem that you could have that millions of other people haven't already had. And you you're very likely can find some information online, either from the, the application or hardware manufacturer support pages uh, or frequently asked questions, uh, or from a YouTube video from someone who's had a similar problem. Now, in this, this telework environment we're in now, most of us have been thrown into this due to, due to the, the COVID-19 crisis, but um, telework is, is something many people have been using for some time and will continue to use. And I'm sure there are many organizations who, as a result of this forced exper experiment with telework, will find that they want to continue to use it. So you want to consider also implementing in, implementing solutions that will grow with your company. Um, you're, you're going to have situations down the road where um, uh, weather events, you know, floods, uh, sick employees, uh, perhaps employees who've had a medical procedure and are home recovering. They don't have the mobility to, to get out to work, but they may want to work and may be able to do so through telework. Um, Issues like inaccessible work locations, if a, a bridge is out or a gas leak in a building or something that prevents you from getting to your work location uh, can be overcome with telework. It's a, it's a great solution for uh, business continuity disaster recovery uh, beyond the current situation, and uh, we shouldn't just walk away from it as soon as this current situation ends. In terms of developing a video culture, um, video meetings allow for that body language, facial expression, visual cues that you always got in a face-to-face -face meeting. And um, they, they may not be something you want to do for every meeting, but try them. Um, they ensure that people are engaged. It's, it's hard to be on a, a video meeting versus a phone call and to engage in multitasking in two or three other things. So as a result, the video meetings generally engage everyone involved. They get right down to business. And you know, other than a, a quick hello and uh, a good morning type thing at the beginning of the meeting, once you get engaged in your work on a video meeting, people tend to stay focused and uh, accomplish the meetings much quicker. So if you're not a, a big fan of video meetings, um, I'd recommend you give it a try, and uh, I think you'll find that it's useful for you. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Chris. Thank you so much, Bernie, for all that insightful information. I know many of us have experienced issues with technology and have had concerns from either personal experience or from watching the news. Uh, so I appreciate you prov providing solutions to uh, some of our common issues. Um, I'd like to now open the floor for questions. I know we've received a few. Um, so if any of you have any questions, feel free to write it in the Q&A, and I'll make sure those get addressed by our two speakers. Um, our first question, um, I don't see GoToMeeting. Um, how do you feel about that application? Well, I'm, 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 take I'm not if you like. Uh, go to, oh, go ahead, Drew. I'll let oh. you go. Oh, that's, that's okay, Bernie. 
I was just going to say, GoToMeeting, I, I think, is um, is a good product, I, um, and it probably should be on that list. It is one of the more more common ones, so maybe when we update that slide deck, uh, you know, we should include it. It's under a suite of products by uh, LogMeIn, and they're actually pretty good applications for telework. So not only do they have GoToMeeting, they've got GoToWebinar, so if, if you're doing uh, larger presentations, uh, they've got a product that's definitely uh, configured for that, and, uh, and also... Um, uh, go to my PC. So if you had access, uh, if you if you needed access to say your desk computer, um, of course you'd have to have that set up beforehand. But um, but yeah, I think I think uh, GoToMeeting probably should be included in that uh, as far as uh, just being one of the more common technologies. And um, you know we don't have particularly any any preference over ones that are better or, or uh, not as good. Uh, you know, uh, 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 what we find is a lot of them have all of the same elements. Um, and, and if uh, go-to meeting is something that you've already invested in and everybody's familiar with, I think it's fine to, to stick with it. And I don't know, Bernie, if you had anything else to add, uh, that, that's fine. No, I, I'm, I haven't uh, myself been a, a big user of go-to meeting a um, little bit, but uh, I know a lot of people who, who do like it and uh, seem to be very happy with it. Awesome, awesome, guys. Um, our next question, I heard there are privacy concerns using the more popular collaborative tools. What should we be aware of, and what can be done to protect our privacy? I'll leave it to Drew to answer first. Sure, I think the, the most important thing uh, with that is, uh, you know, Use the most current release of, of whatever application you're using. I just give you a quick example. Is I, you know I know that Zoom this week uh, announced uh, some new security patches. But you know with any application that you log into, uh, it, sometimes they will prompt you. There's a newer version available. Do you want to download it? And every time they do that, you know sometimes if you, if you don't have much time, you know you, you kind of bypass that step. But the important thing to remember is when they are presenting these things to you, you know, a lot of times it comes with new features, which is great, uh, but the important thing that it does come with is bug fixes and security patches. So I'd say probably the single most thing is to make sure that um, everything uh, that you're using is as current as possible. And Bernie, do you have anything to add to that? I think that's that's an area where um, you know there's a big gap there from working in an office environment or you know an employer's um, stable IT environment to going to a telework environment. Uh, there may be a lot of us who are used to doing those things and and maintaining our our personal computers in terms of software releases and security patches, but uh, it's spotty. It's, it's even spotty among employers. Um, so it's a, it's an area that really needs attention. Um, again, depending on what you're doing and in, in the size of your organization, um, there really needs to be uh, either a, an IT uh, department involvement there, uh, making sure that people pay attention to those things. Um, or again, you, you should form a a group or a committee to discuss what the best approaches should be because uh, it isn't something you want to neglect. You do want to uh, make sure you're up to date on all the, the security patches and such. And sometimes, you know, to miss to miss one or miss two here or there may not seem like a big deal, but then it becomes a cumulative thing. And instead of having one or two small risks out there, um, you have a, a, quite a number of small risks and maybe even a few very large risks. So the, the best approach is to make sure that, that you do keep up on the software updates and security patches. Okay, okay, great. Um, our next question, any recommendations on headsets, brands to research, or any features to expect? I, I could give you just a quick, uh, you know, couple of uh, comments on that. I've been using headsets for a long time, and uh, there's a lot of different brands out there that are that are very good. I, I happen to be on a Plantronics uh, headset today. It's a, a C520M, um, but uh, you know, the, the styles and things like that, 
There's a uh, monaural and binaural, meaning uh, either they'll just cover one ear or they'll cover cover both ears. Uh, if you go with a binaural, um, it sometimes gets a, uh, is, takes a little bit to get used to because it really does cut out all of the uh, noise uh, uh, and other distractions. But once you get used to using it, it actually is uh, it, it's really nice. It allows you to really focus on your meeting. And uh, they also uh, good headsets. A lot of times will have a kind of a boom mic that that shoots out uh, closer to your mouth so that um, and it has noise cancellation. So it allow uh, your voice to really be the thing of focus. And I think the other thing to think about um, is, is, is with the headsets and things, even if you don't have access to a headset, and just uh, I'll give you a quick example. Um, there's a headset that I really like a lot. It's just a, a wired headset, uh, USB, and nothing fancy that I, I think um, you know a couple of years ago paid fifty dollars for. I noticed now it looks like they're about one hundred and eighty nine dollars, and I don't know if that's because they're in demand. Um, but uh, what we found too is is if you don't have access to a headset, even if you use earbuds or uh, AirPods, uh, those two what they do is they end up taking. Uh, the, your voice, the sound from your voice, and, and it's a lot closer to your face. So rather than just using, um, you know, a PC or a laptop, uh, that's going to, as Bernie said, uh, pick up any any type of noise. Uh, the, um, using a product like that, if you don't have access to a headset, may actually help you to be more clear as well. Andrew, would you recommend using a headset versus just using your computer audio? Absolutely. And Bernie, did you have anything? Yeah, I, it just. I, th I think I've I've uh, I've kind of homed in on the the AirPods and uh, myself. And when you look at a headset, um, you know, especially if you start reviewing them side by side, looking at the specifications, you know, you'll you'll typically see among the specifications, it'll tell you how much they weigh, and how much they weigh is not a big deal when you put a headset on for 15 minutes and then take it off. But if you're going to be on calls constantly or most of the day, the weight of the headset and also the clamping force, especially if you get a, a the type of headset that has an earpiece on each side and a headband over the top of your head, the weight of it and that clamping force against your head uh, will get kind of old after a while. And uh, I found that I like the AirPods. You know, they're they're great a great thing because you can also use you know put one in while you're driving if you're on a call when you're driving. Um, you know, the Bluetooth connectivity um, is great, and of course, a lot of the headsets use Bluetooth connectivity as well. Um, so if you can, for me, I like the AirPods because they I can use that device in multiple situations, uh, but I've used a number of different headsets over the years and, uh, uh, you know, found that, it, you, as Drew said, you, you absolutely want to use one um, versus computer audio, but it, as you use them, um, you know, you, if you try a couple of different, different ones, you'll find you get to a price point where, um, you know, unless you're much more of a uh, able to to detect the the nuances in in audio more than I can. Um, There's kind of a point of diminishing returns. You know, you you probably don't want to buy the seven dollar headset, but I don't think you need to buy a two hundred dollar headset. They're out there, and and you can buy them. Um, you know, in in the case of of something like the AirPods, they're expensive, but but they have multiple purposes. But if you're buying a a headset, a, you know, a Bluetooth or, or wired headset, um, you know, you should be able to find something at a reasonable price. And again, if you, you talk to your peers, uh, they may have some recommendations as well. And Drew, I did cut you off. I do apologize. Did you have anything else to add? No, I think that's it. That's, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, and our next question, uh, how do you find webcams and headsets when every store is sold out of, out of supply? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that one I don't think I have an answer to. I've, I've been a, uh, a victim of that, um, that lately myself. I, I had, um, of course, when you start researching something, availability kind of comes into play, and I made the mistake of, deciding what I wanted. I really 
Um, you know, I, I use my computer's webcam, the built-in webcam, but there's one that's a, a Logitech Brio uh, webcam, and the list price is $199 on it. And it's just got great features. You can control the field of view. You can control the zoom. It's got a lot of great features, and it really has uh, kind of risen to the top as being a, a top webcam these days. So uh, as I said, they typically list for about $199. Um, if you can find one, they're typically going for double that price right now. And um, occasionally you do a search for one, and, and you, by the time you drill down into the, the website, you will see they're, they're not available. So I think all we can do in the, in the meantime is you, know, you can look at the used market on eBay, et cetera, and, and try to find something if you can buy it from someone you trust or, or reasonably trust. And uh, otherwise, we just use the, the webcams that are built into the computers and uh, uh, make, make some changes down the road when the, the demand lightens up a little bit. OK. Um, and the next question, since the shift to work from home, employees have had to prepare their workspace with the appropriate gear. How should employers? and employees approach reimbursement of these tools. Uh, do you have any recommendations or examples that you can share? Well, I, I could uh, share with you. I, I think that, you know, every, every situation is different. And I think, uh, you know, um, I can give you some examples. I know uh, at, at my company, we, they do provide for me. I have a printer at home. And they, they provide my paper and my ink cartridges, which I really appreciate because they're very expensive. Um, but uh, you know, I think uh, with with every organization that's uh, asking people to work from home, they really should give some thought as to what things can be reimbursable and lay out a plan or a structure for it. Because I think um, really what you want to do is is implement something that works for your employees and also is fair. And, and it's fair for everybody, and that everybody is aware of it, so that uh, people aren't being, you know, treated differently. Um, but you know, where we had seen this a lot really was uh, with cellular, where uh, people, where businesses were, you know, people were using their personal cellular devices, their own data plans, um, in order to um, support business, uh, in, in order to support their job. And um, and so, you know, thinking through all the things that we may be asking. Um, our employees uh, to, to use personally and coming up with a, a plan that uh, helps them you know to, to feel good about uh, about using personal things um, and and also uh, get the support that they need um, you know financially uh, is something that's fair uh, you know some I guess some thought or planning should really go in uh, to every business to figure out what's appropriate okay And then, Bernie, would you like to add anything to that, or did you cover it? I think I think as a, one of the difficulties there is is you can get really tied up in in the details um, in in chasing that if if you let it go too far. Uh, you know, many organizations will say, "Okay, we're going to give you know a twenty dollars stipend toward your cell service. You buy it, you handle it, whether you." buy an iPhone or an Android phone or Verizon or, or Sprint or whoever is up to you, uh, we're not going to get tied up in that. Others will, will tend to get tied up and say, we want to see a copy of your bill every month. Um, we'll reimburse you to the penny. And uh, you can spend more money in the reimbursement process than, than what you're spending doing the actual reimbursement. So somewhere there's a balance there to, to make sure that neither employers nor employees are taking advantage of each other because that can certainly happen. Fortunately, it's typically in a very small percentage of cases. Um, but some people will feel that in, in those cases, um, we need to, to chase things down right to the penny. So I, I think in general, if there is a reimbursement there, um, sometimes just a, a flat, fair amount can be agreed upon. And um, in some cases, the benefits of being able to work from home, you know, if, if I were to have to buy a device, um, 
I'm, I'm probably saving more on gasoline or or public transit costs uh, to pay for that device than if I drove into work and used it. So there's a I think there's a balance to be struck looking at the the pros and cons of uh, uh, those expenditures and the reimbursement process. Okay. And another question that we have for you both, uh, what is the best resource for signing documents uh, when you don't have a printer? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So there are some online applications like DocuSign, and I think there's even more than just that. Uh, the, that's DocuSign is the one that I've used the most. I believe it's a subscription-based application, but it is certainly possible. And I know some of our clients actually use a digital subscription, um, uh, um, digital signature, I mean, um, and uh, not exactly sure how they apply that. But um, I know uh, signature uh, digitally is, is definitely um, definitely something that's doable. I don't know, Bernie, if you have any more experience. I, I that, don't have any experience beyond that. But in, in trying to deal with some of those things, I've run into situations where um, you know, I've been on the road or unavailable to, you know, not not able to sign something. And sometimes, um, you know, sometimes there are documents that certainly absolutely have to be signed due to uh, circumstances. But uh, sometimes you can, you know, beg off it with an email that provides some written uh, confirmation or something and you know an arrangement that it will be signed at a later date or you know and trying to to find those alternatives maybe maybe able to reduce the instances where it has to happen um, you know some years ago I was I was trying to find a fax machine and to scan a document and send it to somebody and I you know all of a sudden the light bulb went on it's like well I'll just take a picture of it with my phone and text it to them you know and that that works so there sometimes there are some alternatives and uh, you know asking the people that you're communicating with if you can use some of those alternatives uh, might be the best bet okay excellent and uh, are there any examples of companies doing different things and uh, different tech tools to communicate with customers during the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of what's happening now is obviously we can't have uh, large gatherings. Uh, so doing things like webinars has become uh, more uh, common. Um, you know, same thing with training sessions. Uh, they're organized more as webinars. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the tools that will allow you to, to present webinars, usually those are the ones that, that um, you know, could take place, uh, take the place of, say, a town hall meeting and, and things like that. Um, also, just, you know, for organizations that do have to, are dependent on, you know, a lot of uh, customer in-person type meetings, you know, obviously those have shifted over to, um, you know, collaboration platforms like the ones that Bernie was mentioning earlier, uh, where you know you you can uh, sit in a room with your client and do it through a video conference, and uh, use tools such as an online whiteboard instead of um, instead of a, a whiteboard in person and and share your screen and so forth. Okay, and Bernie, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I really don't. Other than I think folks have been thrown into situations where they thought they would just delay certain work here, um, you know, and just say, "Well, we'll stop this project, or we'll put put this off, or we'll make a decision later." And then once they found out how extended this uh, this current situation is, um, to say, "Well, you know what? We we do need to look at some of the alternatives." So where, you know, two weeks ago we said we weren't going to do video conferencing. You know, some town governments are holding meetings by video conference, uh, things of that nature. So um, the, the, we're all more, more or less being forced to do some things differently than we might prefer. Um, but I think as, as more time goes on, more and more people are, are going to find they, 
they have to use those collaboration solutions. I think the, the silver lining for them is once they do, they'll find out and, and kind of say to themselves, why didn't we do this in the first place? And why don't we do this on an ongoing basis for other similar situations? I think that segues into our last question. Uh, what do you think is the biggest surprise for employers with this huge increase in telework? And uh, same for the employees. Well, I think from the employer side, it's, it's kind of all over the map. I think there's going to be a lot of surprises that continue to, to, to come up. One, hopefully they find that, that, that this is a viable way to do business because I think what this does is if, if you get uh, everyone comfortable with the scenario, um, if in the future you have a situation where, where you can't report to work, you kind of have a fall, fallback plan. Um, so uh, being comfortable with this, uh, a nice surprise might be that you almost have a, a little uh, built-in business continuity plan. Um, another uh, interesting thing that I've seen come up with one of my clients is now that they've seen how well this can work is uh, from an employer perspective, uh, as they look at real estate in the future, um, they may look to reduce their footprint knowing that they could have uh, an organization or, or people from their organization work from home and not need office space. Uh, so those, those are a couple of things. Uh, one thing that may be a negative surprise from an employer perspective, I think, is you know we've had a few clients that had to jump into this quickly. And when they were able to get access to products for their uh, uh, for their employees, in other words, order a bunch of cell phones, you know, order a bunch of laptops, things like that. Um, I, I think there, there, you know, maybe some surprises with that, uh, with managing their inventory um, and, and how that uh, becomes a little bit more difficult to do without a plan around it. Um, and then once those bills start to come in, they're going to have to work their way through it. Um, and then also some of the things I think Bernie may have, have touched on this is that uh, every time you want to do updates, uh, apply patches, you usually want to push them out centrally uh, with an approved uh, um, version that, that your company ha has come up with. And, and sometimes it's very hard to do in a, in a very distributed uh, environment. I think from an employee perspective, um, you know, some of the things that are that are pretty surprising, I think, is is uh, you know when you end the day, uh, you know, it just seems like you have more time. Um, I feel like a lot of the time, if you can figure out how to work efficiently from home, it actually opens up uh, more time for you, uh, whether it is to to focus on work things or to eliminate that commute so that um, you could spend time with your family. Um, so that's I think a positive su surprise from the employee side. Uh, I think some of the negative things, and I, and I don't want to say negative, but maybe just a little bit harder to deal with on the employee side is just, you know, a lot of families aren't necessarily set up for you to work from home. Uh, the, their home situation, uh, technology or otherwise, is kind of set up, you know, maybe where they're forced to work in a room that's maybe a kitchen or, or you know, as Barry said, maybe, uh, 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 Bernie said, you know, maybe when you set up, you need to look for where your Wi-Fi signal is best. And, and so sometimes the situation that you're in to, to, to work from isn't always optimal. Um, so you know that might be a little bit on the negative side. But I think those are some of the surprises that uh, we're seeing come up as far as the concept of, of, of telework is a really good one. Uh, but then when you get to the tactical implementation, um, you know, none of these challenges are, are anything that, that can't be overcome. But uh, you know, sometimes there are things that you just you, uh, didn't think about, so they're a surprise. Okay. Thank you so much to our uh, guest speakers. Uh, we are at the top of the hour, and to respect everyone's schedule, I'd like to uh, thank you for attending today's webinar. And don't forget to join us next week for our final webinar in this series, Embracing Cultural Change to Support Teleworking Beyond COVID-19. Um, I'd also like to remind you that you'll be prompted to complete an evaluation. We ask that you please complete this evaluation as your feedback helps us improve our presentation. Thank you everyone so much again for joining. Thank you again to our speakers and everyone have a great Friday.